So uh, it, it takes it takes quite a bit. So exactly. we are at 11 o'clock and I think we're gonna get started over here. <clears throat> Hello everyone. So thank you for joining. I see more and more people uh, joining, but we are gonna get started uh, sharp at uh, 11 o'clock central, 12 Eastern. Um, a couple of uh, just uh, quick house uh, keeping rules. Uh, I always get the question, are we going to post the recording of the webinar? Yes, we will post that. Uh, we also do something a bit different. Um, so we usually uh, break the webinar into smaller chunks, about two to three minutes. We pick about 10, 15 different segments from the webinar. We post them on LinkedIn just for easy consumption. So that's one thing. Uh, the topic today is uh, is radical. Uh, <laughs> goes well with the title of the webinar: "Radical Differentiation: A Key to Improving Conversions." Uh, but even even more, just really fun. Like you know, um, having Louis uh, and I, I'm going to butcher your last name, but hold on, I will try. Grenier? Am I am I even right? Yeah, it's good, man. Okay, thank you. Gren People, Grenier. 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 There you go. People uh, butcher my name all the time. I had a client today call me, and I, this is the last story I'm going to mention before we jump in over here. Uh, he called me at 6 a.m. It's never a good idea to have a client call you that early. And I'm like, oh my God, this must be like, we must have done something really bad. Um, and he's been a client for, for two months. And he called me actually to tell me how happy he is with the team. And I'm like, 6 a.m. Okay. Uh, but the funny part, and the reason I mentioned that. this, because he's been working with us for two months, but he butchers everybody's name, my name, everybody on the team. I'm like, who's he talking about? I'm like, oh, oh, he's mentioning Ayat. Okay. Uh, my partner, but he mentions her name in a different way. Um, anyways. Um, so Louis, I mean, if, if unless you've been living under a rock, you, you don't know him, um, runs the most popular, uh, at least in, uh, at Invest, the most popular podcast. And I've been really honored to be a guest. Uh, everyone hates marketers. Uh, he has a, a, an amazing program that we were just chatting about, Stand the Fuck Out. Um, just absolutely amazing program. And I think he sort of like, you know, um, zoomed in on a very critical topic. How do you really stand out? Because everybody is the same, correct? Services, products, uh, <laughs> um, and, I, and I can just mention so many stories uh, in, in that, but uh, you are here not to hear from me. So let's turn it over to Louis and let's have him, uh, you know, have at it. And I'm gonna be on mute. I'm gonna be jumping on the chat, talking to people, uh, but uh, Louis, the floor is yours. Thanks, man. I appreciate that a lot. And yeah, as you said, differentiation. That's a topic that everyone is talking about, branding experts, marketing experts, positioning experts. And yet, over the course of my career, when I was thinking about the topic and really understanding, is there an actual recipe, an actual step-by-step, -step, something I could do where I don't have to guess the next step? I could not find materials on it. I'm not saying there are no books on the topic. We are talking about like blue ocean strategy or differentiate or die or whatever, or purple cow. But, but, and I'm pretty sure people attend this webinar would say the same thing. No one is really talking about the actual fucking actionable thing behind the principles, the actual thing you must do every day, every minute of every day. And so that was kind of my, the thing I've been working on for the last few years and a few months. And what I'm going to present to you today, thank you, by the way, for attending. Thank you for paying with your attention and your time. I know it's valuable. Uh, I'm going to share with you five steps to radically stand out. Uh, do ask questions in the chat and then we'll come back to it, right? I love Q&A. Uh, I love improv. I don't do improv, but I love improv. So um, I'm going to share my screen now and then do the traditional way of doing a webinar, which is sharing my screen. And hopefully it's not going to be boring like the rest of them. So stand the fuck out. Five steps to radically stand out and increase conversions. And we're going to look at it from a very higher level perspective. Uh, I'm not going to share tactics that are going to work today and not tomorrow. I'm not going to share very, very specific stuff you can do today on your website in the menu bar to increase conversion by 0.2%. None of that. I'm going to take a level slightly higher where we're going to talk about principles that will always work because they're rooted in psychology and how those principles will work for anything inside marketing when you want to radically differentiate, but also within your website to increase conversions. 
So with that in mind, this is the, the picture I use uh, all the time now to describe the problem that I actually told you a few minutes ago, which is, this is how it feels when you have a business, when you want to launch a business, when you struggle, you're not number one in your category to radically stand out or to stand out. Everyone is telling you, you need to draw the all, uh, and then you have to figure out how to, rest, uh, how to draw the rest of the fucking all yourself. Um, and radical differentiation, to just define it what it is briefly, it's just the intersection of two things. It's something that is different and compelling for people. Simple as. So it's not mass product. It's not like marketing stunts and growth hacks that are only going to work for the next two months. It's not just niching down because you can go niche and have the exact same offering than someone else in your niche. It's really the different and compelling. So keep that in mind for the next few minutes. That was me a few years ago. I loved to get people attention. I was craving attention, the attention of my mom, the attention of teachers, the attention of my friends. And the, the way I was doing it was by trying to poke holes and find gaps into their thinking. I got called an intellectual terrorist once in high school uh, for that reason, because I was always trying to fucking poke holes and annoy people. And for some reason, I lost that edge about me. All right, and everyone is is a kid. You know, as a kid, you or you might have done something similar. But for me, it was very ingrained in my in the way I was doing stuff. And then I, a few years after, I launched my first marketing agency, and I did what people expected of me, what I thought people expected of me. I bought this three piece suit. Uh, I hired a photographer uh, for two hours in the mid in the, in the middle of a Dublin city center, and I acted like a marketing consultant. I completely disregarded who I was as a person, what I believed, um, my strength, my unique abilities, or the thing that don't give, me, don't give me much energy. And looking back, I look at those pictures with, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm cringing at it because I'm, I'm proud of what I've done, but I've learned so much from it. And, and this is a big mistake I've done. So I, and I'll tell you why it's so important in radical differentiation too to identify your strengths and unique abilities. Um, and then since then, done a lot of stuff, failed in a lot, but I had also a lot of successes in, in a few areas. As, as Halin mentioned, uh, Everyone Hates Marketers is the only uh, marketing podcast for people sick of marketing bullshit. Uh, we have more than 1 million downloads and, and, uh, so far in the last four years. A zero ad budget, uh, no corporation behind me. I've achieved that through radical differentiation, and I'll share with you how to do it. I work for Hodger as well. We repositioned the entire business. It went pretty well, not just because of me, far from it, but uh, I also got a chance to interview one of my, my hero, uh, Seth Godin. So, and finally, yes, I've launched this 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 eight week program, uh, Stand the Fuck Out, to teach a radical differentiation to people who really want to uh, to do this. So. That's the context, right? Now, five steps to make your product service radically stand out. Again, I'm trying to deliver on the promise here. And please, if you have any questions whatsoever, like pop in the chat and we, we will absolutely get, get back to that. And Halid in any way is ready to go answer any. So step one, let's get rid of your self-limiting belief. I know you have some. And by self-limiting belief, I mean things that prevent you from just doing that thing, launching that thing, trying that thing. The first one is, yeah, that's interesting what you're saying. Yeah, we need to be differentiated. But you know what? Standing out is risky. I mean, if we take some risk and it doesn't work, what's going to happen? Let me ask you another question then. Uh, what's going to happen if you don't take risk? You're going to face obscurity. Simple as. Uh, clutter is everywhere. Everyone with a laptop and a brain can start a company tomorrow or even today. You have no choice but to take risk. And to play with those words a bit, the only risk is to not take any, right? And this is the mindset that we must have. You simply cannot stand out and cannot be seen as the only company, the only offer, the only product, the only person without taking risk. It just doesn't go uh, together. So that's the first one. But everyone else is doing this way, right? You see all of those companies in their category, they all do the same thing. They all have their website looking the same way. They all have their ads looking the same way. They all use the same copy. Everyone else is doing it this way. Well, let's see the other way. If everyone else is doing it this way, this is your opportunity to play inside that category. This is 
I get excited. Tell you what, I get excited when I see categories or industries where everyone is doing the same thing comes because I know it doesn't take a lot to actually do something radically radically different because the the average is so bad. So this is an opportunity. Don't see it as a weakness. Uh, fight this urge, and this is why there's a picture of a nature. Fight this urge that comes from our ancestors, which is about you know when you're part of a group and you want to survive, don't stick your head out. Be safe, stay within the group. That's normal that you feel this way, but you need to fight it. You're not in life or death situation anymore. You don't have to fight whatever creators out there to, to find food. And therefore, sending out uh, the fact that everyone else is doing it this way is not anymore a signal for you to do what they're doing. And the last self-limiting belief is super interesting. That's from the book, uh, The Paradox of Choice. There is one well-known fact about this book that gets uh, thrown out a lot, which is, you know, the more choices you had uh, after a certain point, the less likely people are going to make any choice because they're going to feel overwhelmed. That's a well-known fact. Less known part of this book talks about something quite interesting. Um, so you might have this belief of, well, if you we focus on one thing, do that thing very well, go niche down and take that risk. We're going to miss out on everything else. We're going to miss out on all the potential clients that we could get if we don't go niche. We're going to miss out on potential people who, who, you know, if we do something too edgy, maybe some people are not going to like it. Therefore, they're not going to buy from us. The, the thinking behind this, this idea the, the, is very interesting. Think about it the other way. What are you missing out on by not focusing on something, by not sending one clear message, by not... Uh, making the, the, the curry less spicy, you know? What are you missing out on? You are missing out on a lot. You are missing out on expertise because you can't dive into a subject matter, uh, a subject um, that deep. You are missing out on trust and authority because people perceive experts to be more trustworthy and they pay you more uh, for your expertise. You are missing out on money as well. The less message you show, the more likely people are going to process and remember each of them. Therefore, if you focus on one thing, if you don't focus on one thing, you're going to miss out on a lot more than you think. So try to ask this question the other way. It's not about what are you missing out on if you don't focus. It's really, yes, what are the things you're going to miss out on um, if you don't focus on one thing, if you don't take that risk? So those are the beliefs. And I'm so into that because mindset and confidence is absolutely the key. You can't stand out without having a good knowledge of yourself, whatever, if you're a CMO, VP of marketing, a marketer inside a company, an entrepreneur, you need to get that mindset in check, work on that because the next step are uh, only work when, when you have that uh, in order. So step two is something that is market, like marketing 101 in a sense, but yet it's not really being talked about the way I feel it should be talked about when it comes to market. A lot of mistake there. So this is the OFC, the little green part inside of our brain, the orbital frontal cortex. It's a beautiful piece of equipment. Um, the OFC assigns a value based on goals and rewards, right? So when we see something, when we're about to make a decision, the OFC uh, just uh, in front of our brain there straight away understands, okay, what is the value? What is the reward? What am I going to get out of this? And our behavior, the things we do, is then driven by the difference between the actual state we're in and the desired state we want to be in. And the way I visualize it is a bridge, simply. A bridge, and you want to cross it, but it's not that easy. You have a path to take. You have multiple options. You can jump off the bridge and swim and go to the other way. You can cross the bridge, but there are holes uh, all uh, within it. You can take a plane and whatever the way you get to it, you want to get to the desired desire state. And the reason why I'm talking about it from a biological standpoint, psychological standpoint, scientific standpoint, is because when people talk to you about job to be done theory or understanding the pain they want to solve and the goal they have, it's because of this, because of this part of your brain, that's what it does. And so you must understand that from the perspective of your customers. This is the one of the like job to be done canvas. I don't want to go too much in depth about this methodology, which I think is a bit too complex sometimes to make it uh, simple to understand, but that's very simple to understand, right? There's a trigger, something happens, whatever it is, a pain that is getting bigger. Someone telling you about something, you saw an ad, um, 
you if you buy the product and now you need to buy something else to to make the uh, uh, best use of it and then your goal is to go to this desired outcome you have multiple options there in front of you um you have this desire to go this attraction which is the the push uh, to go towards the, the top but also your customers have this anxiety the friction and the force of habits and this is this this war that you need to understand as a uh, as a marketer it's your duty as a marketer as an entrepreneur as a creator to do the emotional labor on behalf of your customers you need to understand them almost better than themselves and the reason why it's so important is because i advise folks even folks who are vps of marketing with thousands of customers to try to look at their customer uh, using four criteria joy access pain and profit joy is being how much do you enjoy working with them and i know it's a weird question to ask and i know usually profit comes first when people tell you you need to identify your best customers but guess what it's going to be difficult to stand out and radically differentiate and do stuff that are that people won't normally do if you don't really have this connection with those people that you seek to serve if you don't have this joy of working with them if you are not looking forward to talking to them if you find them boring something is not going to work um, that's how i felt when i had my first agency i didn't feel this connection and this is why i've changed things around so that i could be in front of people i admire and then i actually enjoy working with the second thing is access funny enough as well so many companies are being founded based on the idea of yeah let's pick this market and then we figure shit out you must have some access to those people do you have a newsletter uh where cmo subscribe to do, are, do you have are you an admin of a facebook group where you have access to people do you have a podcast uh, do you have a huge linkedin following um do you have budget to pay ads and to reach out to those people are they even online are they even reachable so many mistakes are made there because people realize they have a beautiful positioning and then and then oh how do we get to those people so access sounds simple on paper but it's far from being uh, simple um, the other one is pain and that describes what i told you about before with the bridge and the ofc and whatever do they have a bleeding neck problem and when you are i don't know if some of you have been in sales before i've done sales or still doing sales you realize the difference between a pain point and a nice to have pretty fast when you talk to customer and try to sell to them the bleeding neck problem means i need to solve that right now um the vitamin side of it uh, the other side the nice to have is is clearly not a big deal for them yes it will be nice to potentially have this but it's not and they will never uh, pull the uh, pull the plug so you want to identify customers who have that bleeding neck and i'll tell you it's not demographics or firmographic it's not about those cmos have this pain it's deeper than that and i'll show you that in the next uh, few slides and then finally profit and money and, and whatever but not only do they make do they give you money are they taking all the time you know are they are they sucking the life out of you in terms of energy i also think about that and, and the time you spend with them so profit is not just money um so to identify those customers your minimum viable market fits into that description you love working with them you have access to them they have a bleeding neck problem and you're making money they have money to pay you and again that sounds fucking simple but trust me so many mistakes have been made and still being made and i've made so many thinking that i could sell to people who don't have money and unfortunately yes we're not a charity and most of you are not and 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 you need to make ends meet so here's my advice i'll i'll mention something louis over here sure uh so, so somebody was trying to sell me something recently and i'm like tell me how much the cost is and he's like oh i have to explain the benefits i'm like okay i'll i'll listen 50 minutes later and and i'm like okay how much does this cost uh bed nonetheless it's the future bed that is going to solve all your problems and i'm like yeah i've been really struggling i went through the whole spiel and at the end he finally reveals the price and it's $22,000 and i'm like you know i do have a problem however i don't know if i have $22,000 to solve that problem it's you, there's a complete mismatch over here. I'm like, you could have really solved, you know, saved yourself a lot of time, saved me a lot of time, you know, and, exactly. But anyway, sorry to interrupt. Go, go for it. No, no, it's all good. But yeah, exactly. But that's one of the, one of the ways, you know, uh, and, and when it's your own situation, you realize it pretty quickly. You must do something and you must do it quick. So my, my advice is to talk to at least three customers. 
I know that traditionally people will tell you, right, go on Google Analytics and, and check the demographics there and look at the age group and their interests and whatever. I call bullshit on that. You must talk to customers, period. The depth at which you're going to get information there, the memories it's going to build for you, the certainty it's going to build for you, uh, the confidence you're going to have in your own ability to sell to them, the way you're going to visualize who you're talking to is going to change once you talk to customers directly. So don't sweat it, do it. Don't just sit behind your screen and look at Google Analytics and think that you understand your people. You don't until you talk to customers directly, which is why salespeople are great marketers because they, they do that all day. If you really can't, then listen to sales calls. If you don't have a sales team, you don't have any excuse. You must talk to people. You must talk to customers. It's possible recent customers have recently buy, uh, bought from you. And act like a journalist. Don't try to sell to them. What you want to know are the following. So this is a lot of questions. Take a screenshot. Those questions are traditional questions that people tell you you should ask people when it comes to understanding that bridge, understanding the hill that they're taking, right? Remember what I showed you before. Those are the questions that you must ask to basically find out the path they are taking the experience so that you can really market to them the right way. So again, take a screenshot. Those are, those are nice questions, but the two questions I've, I don't see often, in fact, I've never seen, that really help you to stand out, to go one step further than just understanding them are those two. I love asking those. What's the one thing you hate the most about our industry? So for Halid, for example, when he's talking to customers, you should ask, what's the one thing you hate the most about conversion rate optimization agencies? They might say, well, they think about numbers, they don't think of our people or whatever. Um, Ask, them, ask this question, and then we'll come back to it uh, in a few, why it's so important. And then what cliches are you sick of hearing, again, about our product, about products in our category and whatnot? I love asking those questions because it starts to give you material to play with. You'll see it's like Play-Doh. You'll be able to identify something and say, oh, aha, everyone else in my category is doing this. Everyone else seems to be sick of it, yet no one is doing anything about it. Aha. There is something interesting there. So I love asking those questions. And ask yourself that question as well. I was so sick of marketing podcasts, interviewing guests without, never, without ever listening to them and covering 10 topics per episode with ads interrupting you every single 10, every 10 minutes that I did my own. Didn't need to ask anyone else. I felt the urge to do it. And it seemed like a lot of people felt the same way. So this is how you can achieve differentiation. Those two questions are gold. I love them. And then you want to go to the edge of the map. Remember, we are in the market uh, portion of it. The edge of the map when it comes to your market. Don't settle for the average group of people like we are selling to millennials. I got an email uh, last week about that saying, saying someone, uh, their target market are millennials. Well, bad news for you, this is not going to work. You can't define a market by a, an age or demographic. However, the way to define your market so that you can offer them something radically different is not about demographic. It's about who stays awake at night staring at the ceiling the most? Who wants to reach their goal the most? Who loves you the most? Who hates the things you hate? Who has money to pay? Those are kind of the questions that I love to answer. And usually, usually those give you an insight into, into the people that you seek to serve. And those people want something very badly. And you're going to struggle to put them into like one particular demographic or firmographic. Like it's not necessarily going to be just VPs of marketing or CMOs or between the age of 20 and 40. No, you're going to understand them from a psychographic standpoint. And then you can look at, okay, of the people who really want badly this, who tend to be in that group? Who tend to be in that group? And that could be, well, maybe copywriters and entrepreneurs uh, of bootstrap companies tend to be in that group uh, way more than, than usual. For the podcast, for example, my, my target market are, are simply people who are sick of marketing bullshit. And yet, when I look at the list, the, the listeners and the survey I send and the conversation I have, a lot of times what comes back are people who are sick of marketing bullshit are mostly copywriters, creatives working in marketing, um, like entrepreneurs who want to get into marketing, and so it's difficult just to have one demographic or one firmographic, but they, are, they all have this common thing that put them in the same group. They all are sick of something or they all want to do something. So that's a different way to see it, uh, the, the target market than the traditional millennial or VPs or uh, whatever else uh, people tend to, to define their market. 
I don't know if you're a fan of The Office. I am. And there's the beautiful scene in, uh, in, in season three of The Office where Michael Scott talks about his multiple vasectomies with his, with his girlfriend, Jan. And he's like, snip, snap, snip, snap. Like, she made him do that. Anyway, that's the same for you. Something that happens quite a lot when you pick a market is switching back and forth between markets. And that has an impact on your business and your well-being. And you need to stick to something. Pick it, do your research, interview people, talk to them, and then go all in for a while. If you just keep switching back and forth, differentiation is going to be difficult to achieve. Okay, now we have a group of people. Identify your status quo to mobilize them. It's a very, very nice way to frame something so that they understand the problem better, so, so that they understand what you offer better without ever mentioning what you do, which is quite nice. So yes, I used to be a conspiracy theorist when I was uh, 18. Um, I believe that 9-11 was an inside job. I don't believe that anymore whatsoever, just to be very clear on that. Um, but it was a time when I was trying to figure things out. I was very anxious about the world. I didn't know what job and career I wanted to have. And I believed in that kind of stuff because it made me feel better. It made me feel better to point the finger at one group of individuals who seemed to be responsible for the diseases and bad things that happened in the world. And that's in fact exactly why conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theories exist is because those people tend to be more anxious than average. That's a, a scientific fact. And the way to relieve that anxiety about the world is to name and point at one thing that seems to be responsible for it instead of just all random things that happen because of random events from completely different group of people. It gives you control. And that's, that bias is something that also is being used in marketing, not for bad, but for good, to make people understand what you do very quick without uh, making them think about it too much. And this is how it looks like. This is my, those are my drawing skills. And I'm not ashamed of them. I'm proud of them. I don't care. You get it. Those are six people pointing at a box. Um, and you get you got it. I didn't need to, to design more. So this is what happens. You need to point your finger at something. So example, that's what we've done for Hotjar. The finger that we pointed at was the fact that traditional web analytics tools, that's the, the kind of the enemy, the status quo, Yes, they help you analyze traffic data, but numbers on their own can't tell you what users really do on your website. And if you hide the Hodger wheel at the end, I don't even need to tell you what Hodger does. By just reading this, you, you know what I mean. You understand that, aha, you're actually not going to give me numbers anymore, and I will see, I will know what users really do on my site. So you see the power of pointing finger at something. Now, your status quo is not necessarily and very rarely your direct competition. That's a mistake I see a lot. No one cares about your direct competitors. Your customers certainly don't. Most of them do not compare, do not know as much as you think they know about your competition. They want a job done, they want something done. And what they are doing is trying to solve their pain. Remember, they want to go over that bridge. And what they want is to be understood. They want to know that you get them by pointing your finger at the status quo, that is the situation they are in, the pain they are in, you are nailing that. Um, and then don't hate the player, hate the game. So it's not about Google Analytics for Hotjar, for example. It's about traditional web analytics in general. So we never blame a particular company or particular tool. We blame the market. Uh, and let me give you a few more examples of that status quo. So if I was op opening a French bakery that was uh, focusing on health, and healthy stuff, I would say that buttery croissants are actually tasteless and bad for my health because they're too fatty. I don't even need to describe what I do. You get it. Um, I do croissant, but they're not, uh, they are very tasty and they're actually not bad for your health. Um, if I was selling toothpaste in the beginning of the, the 20th century, um, I would just describe the fact that actually, if you don't brush your teeth, uh, you're going to be seen by your neighbor and friends like someone who's not really important in society and it's going to leave you grime and bad breath and this is why um uh, i'm going to forget the name this is why this this big uh, toothpaste company uh, came up with that minty fresh feeling and also associating the use of toothpaste when it wasn't used whatsoever uh with status making you feel like people who brush their teeth are people who uh, take care of themselves and therefore who are important and then I've done that to you at the start of this episode, uh, this webinar, and you might have realized it or not, but this is exactly what I've done. I pointed the finger at 
positioning experts and experts in general who never really explain how to actually stand out because they want you to figure out or whatever other reason. But that's exactly what I've done. And I didn't need to explain the steps to get where I was uh, going to. So that was step uh, three. Step four is the funniest part. Engineering your radical differentiation. Differentiation is not about saying you're the only one doing this or we are the only, we have this unique value proposition as in you can use words in the dictionary in a, in a brand new ways that no one else can use and or I've ever used, whatever. No, differentiation is the intersection of the category you're in. So if you sell two space, two space is your category. The specific value you provide, and by value, I mean the, the pain you solve or the things you help them do. Again, remember that bridge or that hill, that's the value. I hate the word value, by the way, but it's a simple way to, to describe it. Um, so going on over that hill for a specific market, the market you've described before, that's differentiation. If you remove one of them, it doesn't work anymore. That's the intersection of the three. And when you think about it this way, things get much simpler and way less overwhelming. It's not about trying to find this a new category name or inventing a category or trying to like come up with a product that is just brand new, whatever. No, you can come up with products and services that are not quote unquote brand new. As long as you provide a specific value for a specific market, the intersection of the three makes it actually different. So it's a cycle. If you change the category, the value changes slightly for the market uh, that you're serving. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So here's the fun part. Now, this is the meat of it. This is what people don't necessarily tell you, or at least not in enough depth, or at least not in the same books or whatever else. Remove is the keyword here. Take your product or service and remove anything that your customer don't love. You need to be ruthless. You can't just do average things for average people especially when you're trying to, uh, you're before crossing the chasm, you're prior to product market fit, or you're trying to grow your business, you're not number one in your category. If, like if you're starting out or whatever, this is so important. Remove anything that doesn't elevate what customers love. Remove what are considered cliches and what people hate. This is so fun to do. Honestly, this is really fun because you get the answer. You have certainty about that. People hate X, Y, and Z, and you can play with it. You can remove that. You can turn it into a caricature and remove anything that doesn't solve the biggest pain, the bleeding neck problem you've identified for your minimum viable market. Once you do that, you shed light on the positive and people will rationalize the negatives. This is key. People are not going to say, well, you're missing out on this, on this, on this. No, by removing what is obsolete, by removing what is cliche, you are shedding light on what you do best for that market in that category. That, my friend, is differentiation. Now, you can add a few things if you wish, but be careful. Don't add as much as you remove. Usually, that's a, uh, a rule of thumb. Elevate what customers love. If people love something, double down on it, triple down, 10 exit, like go all the way in. And also make sure that you solve their pain, um, basically, for the customer. It's all about the customer. And if you do it this way, if you play with it, if you try to find, if you play with different lens and, and, and look at all the things you do, I don't mean here just your product itself. I'm talking about the full customer experience from start to finish, all right? So you, your product is part of it, but not only. I'm talking about the delivery of it, I'm talking about after sales, I'm talking about prior to that selling on the website, removing things, um, everywhere, looking at it from a holistic perspective from the point of view of your customer, you'll see a lot of opportunities. So quick example, and again, they're not necessarily about a website to increase conversion, but you understand the, the ramification that it has. So this one is, let me be clear, I'm not political, I'm not trying to promote this guy, he's a French president right now, but the way he managed to become French president is by playing inside the category of political party, by removing mostly career politicians. Most people who have been elected are actually had a normal job. He removed mostly corporate donors as well, uh, got donation from the people, French people, and try to remove opaque communications, even though it can be argued at the minute that it's not really the case. But at least at the start, the promise was there, let me be clear. And then he added one thing, which is a transparent diagnosis. They spent months and months surveying and talking to many French people to have a transparent diagnosis of what they were trying to achieve. That was a radically different political party. 
they managed to be elected because they were the only political party for people disenfranchised with poly French politics. And it worked. Another example, Pepsodent. That was the toothpaste brand, I forgot. Pepsodent, very interesting. Before them, they used to brush their teeth with huge jars of charcoal-based toothpaste. True story. They completely played inside that category. They didn't say they were inventing a new category. Don't call the thing toothpaste, call them tooth cream or whatever. They improved the texture drastically uh, by making it a, a, a kind of a whitey paste instead of just charcoal based. They improved the storage. Um, they removed a lot of storage out of it instead of being a big jar to make it much more, uh, much handier to, to take care of and then much easier to use. And the, the, the one thing that they added that wasn't there was the freshness, the minty fresh feeling. And that worked, that, has, that had congruence. And that worked to elevate the strength and to make sense of the, of the negative, the fact that, yeah, maybe you don't have that much anymore in, inside the jar and all of that. Last example is, is the podcast. I, I told you about it. That's what I've done. I was so sick of the fact that those marketing podcasts were all had so many ads uh, with long intros and scripted questions that everyone asks you where it's clear that the host doesn't listen. So I removed all of that. Uh, I added, or I improved the challenging discussion part because I love to like challenge people and poke holes into people's thinking, as I said before. And then I've added one thing, which is one topic. Um, we cover one topic very well inside each episode and that's it. All right, last step, we are nearly there jolting people into action to increase conversion. So once you understand the market, once you have the confidence to, to engineer differentiation and play within your category, you can jolt people into action. Remember the DOFC. Um, it's a simple thing about decision-making. We are either taking a habit-based decision or a value-based decision. We are either taking a decision out of our habits that are already there or based on the goal we want to achieve. Therefore, we need to jolt people outside of their habits. That's your job. And for conversions, exactly that. When people go on your website, you need to jolt them out of, out, uh, out of their habits when they are new customers. So remember that. That's what you're fighting against. You're fighting against the friction and anxiety and habits. You need to jolt them. How do you do that? Three lenses I can give you today. One, radical clarity. Use your customer's uh, words and simplify your message. Remove the bullshit. Remove the empty words that mean nothing. A-B test, a usability test, talk to people, share your screen, whatever it takes to speak the language of your customers. Yes, that's not table stakes. Far from it, far from it. Radical generosity, share everything you know for free. Be like a, the famous French chefs who writes, who wrote books and books and books. They're not afraid that you're gonna steal um, their recipe and open a restaurant themselves. They know that by, um, creating books and writing books and, and sharing them almost for free on their blog or whatever, they know that it brings a lot of people in. So be willing to share way more than you're comfortable with. And then radical confidence is another one. Challenge the status quo with authority. Go for it. Don't hold back. Go all the way in. In fact, go all the way in just like Linkars did, uh, Linkscars did. They do nothing like the so-called best practices of conversion rate optimization. This gal uh, is not in charge of the business anymore. She's traveling the world because she made so much money. Their website as of today is still like that. They make a ton of money. They went all the way in. She didn't ask herself any fucking questions. She just went in. If she had followed whatever everyone else, uh, was doing, I wouldn't show it, uh, show it right there. Completely different example. A client of mine, uh, Latinus Beauty, they sell shampoo for Latinas in particular. They've challenge the generosity side and try to think about how can we give people something before they even think of us as a product. They created um, this series, um, this uh, novella, they call it uh, in, in Latin America and Latinos in general, we know that, which is like kind of this rom-com family drama, very popular. They created their own. They got 17,000 views before the website was even open. Ton of visitors and customers um, came and bought their product. That, my friend, is radical generosity. And then another one, I'm sorry to mention CXL, but they did that recently. I wanted to share it. Um, they did uh, something that people are not very um, comfortable with, which is usually to, to admit a flaw. But by admitting a flaw, they shed light on the positive. 
they they showed this actual customer review that said I had to watch the content at 0.25 speed to even understand it. And by shedding light on the fact it was complicated, they shed light on the positive. Yes, it's complicated, but that's why it's so valuable. And it's not for everyone. If you're into that, maybe it's for you. Lastly, have the confidence of Bunsen, the, my favorite burger restaurant in Dublin, who sell one hamburger with beef. That's it. Their uh, menu fits on a business card. They removed everything else. They don't have a chicken burger or whatever. They don't have many, many different sauces or whatever. But by removing everything and focusing on one thing, they're able to shed light on the positive. Their burger are the best in Dublin because they don't have to focus on all the stuff after that. So summary, get rid of your beliefs, define your market, engineer your uniqueness, identify your status quo, and then jolt people into action. Last step for you, if you're interested in differentiation, uh, you can go to my site there and sign up to the list. I'm, uh, to, but to my emails, I'm sending emails on the topic every week now. And that's what I had for you. That is absolutely awesome uh, i loved it and <laughs> i was taking screenshots as well <laughs> at the same time because you had some really uh, good points and we had few questions come through uh, you've answered this one but nonetheless um, I'll, i will ask the question uh, naveen uh, asks if we solve the biggest pain uh, then we may lose out on customers that need other problems solved that we might solve how do you manage that? Have at it, Louis. <laughs> well, what are you missing out on if you try to solve all of those other pain points as well? You might be missing out on profits because when a customer knows that this product is perfect for them, they might spend more on it. They might tell more friends about it. So if you just do average, thing, average things for average people, you're going to get average results. Um, so you need to go all in, in one thing with confidence. And it doesn't mean that you can't, once you've grown, and this is the key here, I'm not saying you should do that forever. Uh, this is why once you've grown and once you've got enough traction in that, then by all means, go for it in the other, for another pain, but take your time one thing at a time. If you try to do everything, everything is going to feel like it's not really working. I like that. Um, George asks, what would you do if you are marketing a product? that some people like due to the addictive properties, uh, but within an industry that most people hate, gambling, tobacco, alcohol, due to perceived negative impacts of society. Uh, we said okay. but we are always going to have some interesting questions. So <laughs> thanks, George. That's a nice question. I'm going to, I'm going to struggle. So um, I don't have a good answer for that. I'll be very honest. Um, I, I see marketing as a force for good. I see, I see it to be going way, way beyond anything, like just selling a product or whatever. I think it's a very, very nice way to, to change people's habits. Uh, thanks to marketing, we're able to, to make more people brush their teeth. Uh, we're able to like promote vaccines and whatever. There's so many good things that happen thanks to it. But like anything, it's a, good, it's a tool that could be used for bad and good. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> I, I actually... I always love to think of marketing and even whether we're working with clients or when I look at what, what our clients do, you're not selling products. I mean, yeah, okay, you are selling products, but there is a much larger message there that you are really solving a problem for a person um, and for the right customer. I mean, it, it can be life-changing. Uh, I'll give an example. We have a client that sells dance lessons, just good old fashioned dance lessons, no big deal. We talk to his customers, people who buy the dance lessons. Yep. And we talked to this one priest and he's like, you don't sell dance lessons. You know, what you sold over here is marriage therapy. And he's like, I was so impressed. I actually talked about it in my last Sunday sermon. And he actually sent us the recording of that. He was not, you know, my client thought that he was selling dance lessons. It was something completely different. So that, that's, how, that's how you should think about it. Yeah, that's a very yeah. nice way to think about it. Yeah. Uh, Naveen, talking about CXL, and I was just messaging actually with Pep a couple of days ago, talking about the, the ads, uh, because somebody commented, they're like, oh, I don't like the ads, you know, that you have to watch them a bit slower. I love them. Um, I, there are some people saying, oh, look, it doesn't, I'm like, listen, my gut feeling for people who are familiar with, with CXL, it really resonates well. Um, what, what the guys have done at CXL is just absolutely impressive because I really think that they've lifted the industry. Uh, there's lots yeah. of us doing conversion optimization, but what Pep did was, was just absolutely impressive. So I, I love nature. The work that exactly. But, 
But you see, that's the point. It's not for everyone. Anything you do, unless you're, even Apple sells, I think the number is like 64 million units a year on their latest iPhone. They're not for everyone either. Stop believing that you're doing marketing for everyone. This ad, if you don't like it, it's not for you. Move on. That's the beauty of marketing. You either fucking love it or hate it. If you do something that is average, you're just going to meh. You're not going to give a shit about it. You're not even going to remember it or process it. So this is what it takes. If you want to stand out in today's world, this is what it takes. You can't compromise. You have to fucking go all in or it's going to be extremely difficult. Yeah. It's sort of funny because we just had Super Bowl uh, Sunday <laughs> in the U.S., and some of those ads, I mean, some people love them. Some of them, I, I hated them. I mean, there, there was one ad, I think it, was, it ran for almost two minutes. And I'm sitting there, a room of guy, like full of guys. Uh, most of the guys, by the way, have been, have already gotten the, uh, uh, the COVID vaccine. I think I'm the only one who's not vaccinated because everybody I hang, out, I hang out with is a doctor. Uh, radical differentiation. There you go. Uh, but um, the Jeep ad was running and everybody's looking and they're like, I'm like, I look at them. I'm like, what is this ad for? And they're like, I don't know, but this is just boring. It's killing us. Now, I think every one of those guys would have, because they go hiking and they do all this, but the message does not resonate well. Okay. Uh, do you think, uh, how do you differentiate in a boring category like banking, digital banking? It's my favorite ones. It's very good that there is, that there is boring. It means you can play within it. What do people hate? I mean, I've, I've really described that in, 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 inside the presentation, which is you need to be willing to take risk and do, do stuff that others don't. So look at every single length possible. How can you, what can you remove? What you can you add? What are the cliches? What do things hate? How do you make things easier? How do you make things more difficult? How do you make things more ex exclusive or less exclusive? How do you focus on one particular group within banking? Again, it's, you can't differentiate focusing on everyone with a bank account. You're going to have to focus on one specific market that is tiny, that you understand very well and provide them something that is truly the best for them. This is how you differentiate. And then you can scale up. But like, if you're in this webinar, this is not for you. Um, um, if you're not in this webinar, this is not for you. And if you're in this webinar, this is where it's for you. Um, if you're number one in your category and you need to scale, differentiation is not that important anymore because economies of scale, because money you can spend on ad to drive, uh, to drive uh, distinctiveness and whatever. So to grow, that's what you must do. Um, yeah. Simple. Uh, I, I agree. Like you know, industries where everybody's copying everybody else. And um, I was interviewing a customer recently for a hotel chain. Um, and I'm like, where do you stay? He's like, oh, I don't know, Marriott or, or Hilton. And one, one of those. And I look at our client and I'm like, this is a disaster. You're just one of those. You're just another like you know, chain that seems like everybody else. And like, you got to think about it differently. Um, Nathan asks, uh, do you think it's better to deliver one strong message or create multiple points, which can help the customer justify the purchase? So it's really going to depend on a lot of things, right? And the context and whatnot. But as a rule of thumb, focus on one thing at a time. Uh, and then once you've got them, quote unquote, got them, and once they are further in the journey, understand what you do, then then you can maybe afford to, to add a bit more. But um, there are scientific studies on this. Uh, the more messages, different messages you add, the less people are going to remember and process every single one of them. So it's like focus on one, go all in. And once they got it, move on to the next step. I like that. Uh, Tony asks, um, how do you say uh, how do you say to marketing leaders that insist on cute buzzwords to define a company's product? So um, I love doing this. So in pre-COVID, I, I used to tell people bring customers in into your office, make make your boss uh, sit with them, and then go through the website or whatever you're marketing and make them just talk about it, and you'll see. There's going to be some cute reaction. So try that, show usability tests, show raw feedback from multiple people, from their customers. Like this is a wake up call. This is an intervention, right? Mm -hmm. If after sharing studies, after sharing stories, after sharing actual raw pieces of feedback, after all of that, it's still not a go, then step two is probably to ask for forgiveness instead of permission and fucking go for it and then um, uh, and then prove that it works, doing A-B tests or whatever else. Mm -hmm. If you're very too, way too scared of doing so, and if you think you, be, you might be fired by just trying something new, then yes, we are in COVID's world and it's maybe a bit difficult to hear this, but maybe you need to change job because you can't change people's mind. That's the yeah. most difficult thing to do in marketing. 
uh, it's funny with the buzzwords. Uh, I was sitting with somebody um, and just asking them, what do they do? And he talked for about a minute, used a whole bunch of buzzwords. And I just had to look at him. I'm like, I'm, so, I'm like, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I understood every single word you said, because I know it's meaning, but I have no clue what you just said. And I don't know what you do. Because he just used like, you know, like, you know, synergies and this. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know what do you do, even like, you know, just a very basic level. So um, I remember you mentioned, uh, you mentioned something like that on our episode together. Yeah. You embarrass someone. With that. Oh, definitely. Oh, that, that was all even another, another thing, uh, which was like in a, in a, in a conference. And, and I'm like, what does it mean? And like, and it's the same company. And it, every one of them, like, you know, explains it differently. Um, uh, let's see. So I missed the slide about jolting people into action. Uh, we make decisions out of habits or? Or value. value. So we are either ingraining our habit and we do the same thing we did, or we do something based on our OFC telling us, mm, I can get that out of this. Uh, let's see if you are not doing any of the thinking or implementing these processes, what are the first three things you should do now to get started? Well, one, two, and three is to make sure that you are getting involved in implementing these processes. So you see, the marketing is being perceived more and more as promotion and ads. Uh, only today I was rage commenting on LinkedIn about someone saying, oh, we grew our startup to 4 million revenue per year with zero budget in marketing. Like, come on, you have a full fucking content team producing content for you. Like that's just, and, and the way you improve your product and customer feedback and whatever, this is marketing, everything is. So anyway, uh, to go back to your question, um, marketers, creators, entrepreneurs, whoever you are, if you don't have a say about the product you're selling, the experience that you're, that you're giving, uh, or even access to customers, I don't know what else you can do, to be honest. It's, you must get inside that, the, the real side of marketing. And if you can't ask to be, um, again, ask, ask for forgiveness instead of permission and, and do it anyway, uh, there must be something you can do to, to be in charge in some way, shape or form, to collect feedback, to provide ideas, to send book recommendation, to curate things so they understand what they must do better to send them to everyone else marketers the podcast so that your boss will change their mind there must be something you can do yeah it's funny whenever we hire somebody i always tell them like as a, as a rule for us i'm like I, I don't watch carefully and like i'm like just ask for forgiveness don't ask me for permission because i get overwhelmed and half the time i tell you yes then i'll forget anyways so just go ahead and do it um, and then surprise me. And I'm like, I, I hope at this point, no one's going to do something that's going to kill the business. I'm like, it will be very difficult. So, so don't do something extremely stupid. But otherwise, just, just run with it. But I, I will give another recommendation, Louis. Uh, when, when do you plan on opening uh, the, uh, the program Stand the Fuck Out again? In six months, you said? In September. In September. So waiting list are, if, if, if folks, uh, thanks for asking, uh, but if folks want to go to um, to my website, they'll see a link at the top, Stand for Chaos, and people can join the waiting list already. Uh, but I don't want to talk about me too much. I want to help as many people as possible. No, I appreciate I, you I, asking. I, no, no, um, because I actually like it all. The minute you pop I'm like, oh man, I missed it. Uh, yeah. There are a few programs that I really like, you know, I'm like, I really recommend. Um, I see marketing all the time and I get bored with marketing all, all the time. And I'm like, okay, there's sometimes when you know that there's value. Uh, so when you find something of value, I'm like, okay, go ahead and, and, and do this. So I appreciate that, man. Uh, awesome. Um, there's a few in the Q and A's. Um, uh, oh, I missed even the Q and A. I was looking at the chats. My apologies. Okay. So um, can, can you repeat that term, please? Minimum viable market. Markets. Yep. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Naveen, we answered the question. Mandy, can you reshow the last slide? The five points, I believe. No, that was like, you know, the, the five yeah. points altogether. So a challenge of self limiting belief. Um, identify your market. Uh, identify your status quo. Engineer radical differentiation. And then jolt people into action. Awesome. Uh, how do you differentiate if you were a Monzo or... Okay. A revolt? You have to tell me because these brands yeah. I'm not so familiar with. You see, this is the this is the thing. Those those companies are now at a stage where they don't need differentiation anymore. What they need is distinctiveness. They just need to be seen. That's another marketing principle that is very important, which is uh, from uh, the work that uh, Byron Sharp and, and other in the in the industry have done. 
which means that what, what, what is important then is mental availability. What they need to do there is be seen by their market as much as possible. So people remember them. And when they think of banking, they think of them. Um, that we are not at that stage. So once you are at that stage, differentiation doesn't matter. Differentiation is the way to become Monzo or whatever. So the question can't be answered, uh, properly. So if I were to start in yet another fintech company, I wouldn't try to become yet another Monzo. Again, I would just follow the steps. I would obsess over a specific group of people who have a specific pain that is unmet right now. And it might be tiny, but I would do my best to help them as much as possible with something that is radically different. And then I would start growing this way. You can't, you can't do an, have an average product for millions of people and be differentiated truly. What I mean by differentiation is not only the marketing communication side, but the product, the experience, like those two needs to work together. So it's, you can't is the answer to that question. That makes, makes sense. Um, I was asking, how do you differentiate when your competitors keep a close eye on you and they copy everything you do? Great, so you've won already. That's, That's it. You've won already. Obsess of your customers. Do your thing. You know, when I was working at Hotjar, we used to get a lot of hit because the CEO decided we're going to share our roadmap publicly. Now, it's not stupid. He didn't share every single item on the roadmap. There were some hidden features he wouldn't share. But by doing so, they achieved radical transparency. They were trusted more. And competitors were watching this like crazy and trying to know what they were going to do next. They're already, they already fucking gone. They're already lost. If they, are, if they only do, the one thing that they do is focus on you, then focus on your customers, obsess over them, and they won't be able to know exactly what's happening inside with the decision you make. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, Tone of voice being one of the tools, which elements in the brand personality do you think has the most impact on differentiation? So which elements in the brand personality? will have the most impact? It depends, again, on so many things. So you have, uh, you have brands like Everyone Hates Marketers that are reverse brands that are going against something with force by being obvious about it, by picking an enemy, naming it openly, and fucking going for it and being quite, quote unquote, aggressive. Uh, you have other brands that do the opposite. Uh, my friend Joe Glover from the marketing meetup.com, uh, he his mantra is positively lovely, which is the opposite of what I do, even though I'm not, a, I'm not an ass um, in any way, shape or form, or at least I don't, I hope I'm not. I'm nice to people. Uh, I believe in what he believes, but he's, he's much more nice or whatever. So it depends on the context you're in, the type of customers you want to get to. My people are sick of marketing bullshit higher than the average. They've been burned by the industry or whatever. So their bullshit detector is much more in tune depends on your people. If your people are much more, I would say, I don't know, uh, sensitive about something or whatever, then you're going to need to do something different for them by looking at the category and the other companies and the way they speak. It's, this is where the opportunity lies sometimes. If everyone speaks this way, then you, you can speak differently, but not always. Maybe tone of voice is not something you need to differentiate on. Maybe you just leave it as is, and you have plenty of other stuff you can play with. I like that. Uh, by the way, I, I think you used a, a very powerful keyword over here that you said or phrase, my people, correct? Yeah. Figure out, figure out your people and, uh, you know, and those are my people. It, uh, you know, uh, either like, do things gather like them it. or like find a parade and like, you know, walk in front of it. I think I forgot which book I read that. But that's, man, and I know it sounds simply simplistic almost when I share about this minimum viable market and people want to know how to differentiate. But man, I can tell you like from the experience that I have, the people I've talked to, the clients I work with, uh, the companies I've been involved with, this is the single most important step that almost everyone fails to, to nail. Like once you know your people, once you really know your people, their pain and whatever, things get so much easier from there. But we have this delusion of grandeur as marketers and entrepreneurs where we want to make a fucking million this year. And so we try to target everyone. Don't. The best way to make a million is to make one euro now and then two euro tomorrow and whatever. Be patient, be tranquil about it, and you're going to nail it in the long run. Um, don't be fooled by those quote-unquote success stories because there's a graveyard a massive, much bigger fucking graveyard of companies and people who've tried the same and failed. I love that. Louis, this has been, as I expected, just an absolutely awesome topic, awesome webinar. And uh, 
uh, really good topic. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, I know uh, I've benefited tremendously. Um, we are gonna share the recording uh, of, of this webinar. Um, and uh, we, will, uh, we will actually, I think we're working on a couple of very interesting webinars, hopefully uh, very soon uh, with the brains behind the jobs to be done framework. So expect an announcement from us. So it will be really awesome to have them. Thank you. Thank you everybody for attending and for the wonderful question and the wonderful discussion that we've had until next time. Thanks for paying with your attention and your time as well. I know it means a lot. I know you have so many of the webinars to attend. So I really appreciate you hanging out with thank us. You. And thanks, Khalid. You've been an awesome host as always, as I expected. As well. uh, thank you, Louis. Thank you.